In anybody's language, it was brilliant crime fighting. A further 64 arrests have been made since the lid was lifted on Operation Ironside. The families of those boys deserve uh, some closure in all of this. It was kind of like normality. You, you sort of grew up, it's like, okay, that's, that's how it is. You don't question it. It's just, you know, that's okay, that's it. There was that level of control that was extended out of the genesis of the Calabrian Mafia into Australia. Welcome to the Mafia's Web Podcast. I'm Stephen Drill. I've spent the past two years while working in Europe researching the Mafia and its deep links into Australia. I travelled around Italy where I was chased out of one of the Mafia's strongholds after speaking with people and taking photographs. What I found was disturbing. The Mafia in Australia is not a thing of the past. The Italian crime cartel is here and it's spreading. Its tentacles are not just in drugs and racketeering, but in legitimate businesses too. Some of those businesses are even household names. I've spoken to the brave souls across the globe fighting to curb the Mafia's power. This podcast will look at their tactics, how they are changing, and what, if anything, can be done to stop them. Murder, drugs, extortion. They are the hallmarks of the Ndrangheta the world's most powerful Mafia family. The Ndrangheta is based in Calabria, in Italy's dreadfully poor south. But they set up shop in Australia about 100 years ago. They have been hiding in the shadows ever since, although every now and then, blood is spilled on the streets. For decades, they controlled the fruit markets in Melbourne, the seafood trade in Sydney, planted pot in paddocks in Griffith in New South Wales, and also in Mildura in Victoria. In Adelaide, The Mafia was allegedly linked to a letter bomb that killed a police officer. And far north Queensland was their go-to spot for drug deliveries by light plane from Papua New Guinea. But sometimes the cops have a win. And this year, they had one of their biggest wins in a century. Crooks across the world thought that the Anom app was a safe way to conduct business. They were wrong. And amid the 27 million messages that were intercepted on the app, investigators discovered the Mafia was alive and well right here in Australia today. Today, the Australian government, as part of a global operation, has struck a heavy blow against organised crime, not just in this country, but one that will echo around organised crime around the world. This is a watershed moment in Australian law enforcement history. The Australian Federal Police were behind the Anom Sting, which was called Operation Ironside. They had a fair bit of help from the FBI and other international agencies. In a statement announcing the sting, the AFP put the Australian-based Italian mafia at the top of the criminal tree. The mafia was linked with bikie gangs and Asian and Albanian organised crime groups who worked together to shift tonnes of drugs in Australia. But as I said earlier, I had been looking into the Italian mafia for two years before the sting of the century was even announced. So let's head back to where my investigation began. I started working on the Mafia when I was posted to London as a Europe correspondent for a group of Australian newspapers. One of the sources I spoke to when I began investigating the Mafia said, good luck, you won't be able to get far. But I kept chipping away. I had the nagging suspicion that the Mafia had been overlooked in Australia despite their key role in international crime. It's estimated that just one of the Mafia clans, the Ndrangheta, turns over between $80 billion and $160 billion each year. They don't file tax returns, which is why the estimates have such a broad range. I've spoken to the top investigators who spent decades chasing the mafia. I have also interviewed the undercover cops who have lived with the mafia for years, posing as crooks before taking the crooks down. I spent gosh, upwards of a million dollars just buying drugs, you know, giving away money that was all photocopied and uh, photographed and uh, used and proved later for evidence. I've also tracked down people who grew up in Italy, next door to the Mafia Dons. Uh, You don't particularly grow up knowing what it is necessarily. You know that you, you know that even if they came out of there, you probably don't talk to them. And you will hear an insight from inside the Mafia from someone who turned their back on their family and became a police informer. 
my life is a life of constant watching, of constant carefulness, uh, with a lot of sacrifice. Thanks to luck, thanks to God's help, I'm still alive. So let's go back to 2019, when I started this podcast, before we were all in lockdown all across the world, and before anyone knew anything about Operation Ironside. One of the people I've met over the years chasing the mafia is Roman Quadvalik, the former Australian Border Force Commissioner. There is a very clear moving away by the younger generations. They don't necessarily seek permission to go out and embark on different adventures. Roman was a director at the Australian Crime Commission, and he spent seven years at the Australian Federal Police. He has first-hand experience with the mafia when he was an undercover cop in Queensland. He went on drug runs. That led to a string of convictions and an unlikely friendship, but more on that later. The Mafia is one of the most romanticised crime groups, through movies like The Godfather and the HBO series The Sopranos. The mobsters are made real, with conflicting emotions and unwavering loyalty to family. In real life, they are cold-blooded killers who feather their own nest in an unwavering quest for power. And now they are working with international crime groups, including the Colombian drug cartels, Chinese triads, and bikey gangs to control the world's illegal drugs market. They have moved very, very clearly away from just cannabis as their main drug trade into heroin, MDMA, cocaine, methamphetamine, and the, the third major change. So the first, first change being no longer uh, tied to the familial strictures, the second change moving uh, away from cannabis into uh, poly drug trade, and the third major change that I've seen is that they no longer keep it in the family. They are the, the younger generation of Italian organised crime figures are much more likely to be co-venturing with other crime groups, uh, outlaw motorcycle gangs, you know, ethnic-based crime groups like uh, Chinese triads. Um, and uh, there is a lot more fluency in the way they conduct criminal enterprises. I visited Italy several times. I spoke with prosecutors who had their homes bombed by the mafia and who still lived under tight security. Overall, I was stunned by how poor the Calabrian region was still today and how the mafia strongholds like Plati, a spiritual home for the Ndrangheta, uh, they just didn't show off their cash. If they're making so much money, why not? What's the point? And while the Australian police had a big win with Operation Ironside, the Italian police had been working hard themselves. In southern Italy now, a call centre has been turned into a courtroom for the trial of 355 mafia suspects. It's the biggest mafia trial since 1986, and it focuses on just one clan, the Ndrangheta, who have climbed the bloody pole to be the biggest organised crime group in the world. But like everything in the past two years, it has been crippled by the pandemic. The trial is actually happening over Zoom. Luigi Mancuso is the main accused. He is alleged to have run a drug empire out of Calabria, the mafia stronghold and spiritual heartland of the criminal group in southern Italy. Anna Sergi grew up in Lombardy, the same village as Mancuso, who is known as the uncle. It was kind of like normality. You, you sort of grew up, it's like, okay, that's, that's how it is. You don't question it. It's just, you know, that's okay, that's it. Anna dedicated her life to researching the mafia because of her upbringing. She wanted justice. I was born in Calabria, in the south of Italy. I, when I moved away, aged 18, as you do, you start thinking back about your history and your past. And essentially, that's how my academic insight and my academic willingness to research the Ndrangheta, the Calabrian Mafia, came from. So it came from me leaving Calabria behind. So I studied law and then I, I did all my dissertations and theses on anti-mafia, mafia-related issues uh, up until my PhD, which was in sociology. So I moved away from law and I started researching the Calabrian mafia from a criminological perspective, which is what I do now. I'm a senior lecturer. I'm an associate professor at Essex University, where I lecture in organized crime at master level. And I my projects span from anything that relates to drug 
drug trades, especially cocaine, through ports. And I've recently finished our research project on that, starting a new one on Brexit and ports very soon, uh, but also always about the mobility of the Calabrian mafia and their power grip on Calabria as well. The trial in Italy has been turned on the evidence of Manuel Mancuso, who was brokenly a murder. The mafia's vow of silence, he turned on his uncle. Becoming a state witness is a seismic shift in the mafia. Emanuele Mancuso is the nephew of Luigi um, and he's been, um, he's made a choice a few years back to, he's, he's pretty much mid-30s and, and he's, he's an educated man uh, and he's decided that essentially to save his family's future and his basically sons and daughters future, he needs to break away from the family in, himself. His testimony is a key testimony in the breaking up a family. Anna knows the deep connections that the mafia has in Italy. Her hometown, the village of Lombardi, was controlled by them. Lombardi is a town of 3,000 people. It's a village in the middle of uh, the flatland of Calabria. Um, it's a very unassuming village. Uh, it's uh, like the same, um, you can imagine the same village over and over again with different names in that part of Calabria. They all look the same. It's a um, normal village in the sense that you grow up there uh, with an understanding of some people being more important than others. You do not face any sort of difficulty. The town life goes on pretty much as normal. Turning a blind eye became natural for those in the village. And no one mentioned when Mancuso returned home after a long stint in jail. This house in front of us, this big villa, not that big, but, you know, quite big, with the shutters always down, uh, with everything always silent, no one ever talking, big kind of uh, walls and uh, a couple of dogs <laughs> you could hear barking, but no one ever came out of there. And it was it was kind of like normality. You you sort of grew up, it's like, OK, that's, that's how it is. You don't question it. It's just, you know, that's... Okay. Okay, that's it. Did you know that they were mafia? Yeah, uh, in a way. I mean, you, you don't particularly grow up knowing what it is necessarily. You know that you, that's probably the way I put it. You know that even if they came out of there, you probably don't talk to them. So that's how it's, there is some sort of coexistence, like a cohabitation with people and you pick sides. There have been some awkward moments for Anna, who became an international mafia expert. Her name appears everywhere. She's been in reports uh, about court cases. She's also been a witness, including in the National Crime Authority bombing in Adelaide. That case went to the courts earlier this year. Uh, but I do remember the time he came back because at the, so when Luigi was um, released from jail it was 2012. So I was already much older then. Um, and um, I was already researching. I was already doing my PhD. So I was already having an interest in this topic. Uh, and uh, he came back, it must have been early summer uh, of that year. And in July, at the end of July, there is the, um, the town, the, the, the village um, festival, the religious festival. So every village in Calabria has um, like um, a saint, a patron saint. Uh, and the festivities for this patron uh, in Limbadi is on the 27th of July. And the patron's name is San Pantaleone. And so it's, it's like the village is in it at its best, right? So you have the, um, you know, people playing and dancing. It's like everyone is out. The weather is nice. Uh, it's, it's pure, pure festivity. And I remember him there. Uh, and I, and obviously kind of like to me was sort of strange seeing him. I do remember, I did remember him from my youth. He was sitting at the bar, you know, you knew, you knew who he was, but coming back, T almost, you know, 20 years down the line, after 20 years of prison, uh, you would expect some sort of reaction from this, from the village, which there wasn't. There wasn't any. And he was there uh, looking at the at the statue of the saint, like everyone does, um, which is fairly normal in a way. Um, everything looked very normal. And I remember talking to my dad and saying, like, is, is this normal? <laughs> so should, shouldn't, you know, shouldn't something happen? Anna says that the Mancuso clan on trial in Italy are, in mafia terms, a relatively new family. They exploited the boom in the cocaine trade that kicked off when a new port was built in Calabria in the 1990s. Anna explains how they climbed the blood-soaked mafia ladder. The Mancuso clan is a clan that is uh, historically mm, peculiar. Uh, we are talking about uh, 11 brothers who, uh, of whom Luigi is one and Emanuele is the son of another. 
Um, and it's essentially they are uh, a new mafia family, new in the mafia sense. So they are not 100 years old. They are kind of emerging in the mid 80s. Uh, mid 70s 80s um, and they are born uh, at the back of the boom economic boom of uh, calabrian um, industries in the yeah in the period so they are essentially um, riding the horses uh, in the 80s in reinventing themselves as a family close to some of the mafia clans, um, but in a, in a town, uh, in a village, which is the village of Limbadi, which wasn't historically a mafia village. So they kind of created out of nowhere. They, they were ambitious, many of these brothers, they were ambitious, they wanted a piece of the cake. Um, the port of Gioia Tauro was just being built. Uh, he started working in around 1992. Uh, so they wanted a piece of that. Uh, they were particularly interested in the drug trade since the beginning. They sort of um, offer their services to bigger clans at the beginning as a sort of a um, helping end. But from the very beginning, one of these brothers, Luigi, kind of set himself aside. Luigi has all the characteristic of a mafia boss, a very good one, as in uh, one of those that kind of fills the pages of uh, mafia books is being the boss for years, even if for over, for almost two decades, he was in prison. And he wasn't even 40 years old at the time of the um, 90s and the early 90s, when he became one of the people of reference for the Sicilian mafia, trying to blow up people, <laughs> as you know, at the very early of the 90s. Um, so when Cosa Nostra decided that it was time to start a new era of terror-like attacks to the state, when they killed uh, Giovanni Falcone and uh, Paolo Borsellino, Luigi Mancuso was already one of the people that the, um, Cosa Nostra referred to as a guardian of the area and he wasn't even 40 by then and his family had been in the ring for less than 10 years so he's, he's made up a very quick <laughs> career um, in that sense and most of it is based allegedly on drugs. The case is being run by Nicola Gatteri, a high profile prosecutor in Italy. I spoke to him in Milan where he proudly revealed how he'd become a magnet for the Panetti mafia who would turn on their families. This case has been decades in the makings. This is his words, but not his voice. The difference is the old generation were very resilient. They could stand really long trials and 20 or 30 years in jail and just be very firm and not have any problems. The new generation are more fragile and some of them also collaborate with the justice and so they think the government should target this fragility of the new generation and try to crack it. We saw the bosses from the past who were very hard and their sons are much more fragile. They are reprised, paranoid, but the new thing is that four of them became informant. This crack in the Ndrangheta. We believe the institutions should try to take advantage of it. Australia's mafia connections come from the villages like Lombardi in Calabria. There were reports of mafia moving into Australia as early as the 1920s, but their reach became embedded following a wave of post-World War II migration from Calabria. The main driver of migration was from Plati, a mafia stronghold in the mountains. Well, well yes, look, and one of the main ones, which is where a lot of the ones uh, in, in England came from, is a town called Plati, which I've been to and you possibly have as well. That's crime author Keith Moore, an expert on the mafia in Australia. You would remember the drive-in, there's only one road in and it's potholes and goats and, you know, anybody, anybody, that, anybody in the town can see you or the police or anybody else coming from many, many miles away. There was only 9,000 people living in Plotty in, in between the, the, the 50s and the 70s. 5,000 of those 9,000 people came to Australia most of them to Griffith in New South Wales, which is, uh, you know, was and, and, and certainly still has some figures there, uh, a, a major stronghold of the Calabria Mafia in Australia. And it's, and it's where the, the ringleader for this uh, world's biggest ecstasy bust of 4.4 tonnes, seized in Melbourne in 2007 by the AFP, came from, and that was one Pasquale Barbaro. Keith is also an expert on the world's biggest ecstasy bust which we'll hear about more in another episode. But he highlights the point of how tight the mafia connection was in Australia and how well connected they were to Calabria. It was around that time in Italy that the Nandranga were building their empire. 
The key cash driver were kidnappings. The children of wealthy businessmen were targeted, and the mafia made millions. One of the most famous cases was the kidnapping of John Paul Getty III, who was nabbed by the Nandrangada in 1973. Ridley Scott's 2018 movie, All the Money in the World, told that story. Yes, Pepsi? Senora, we have your son. God, thank you. <sighs> Is he all right? No, uh, Senora, we are um, rapidori, kidnappers, and have him captive. It will require $17 million to release him. I don't have any money. Get it from your father-in-law. He has all the money in the world. Young Paul's grandfather, J.P. Getty, he refused to pay the ransom. He said that if he paid one ransom, he would have 14 of his grandchildren kidnapped. He eventually paid $3 million US ransom, and his grandson was released. But young Paul left minus an ear and came back with an addiction to alcohol, which he had been fed as a painkiller. But it was cash from those kidnappings and others like it that fed the marijuana crops in Australia, according to Enzo Macri. He's a retired Italian prosecutor who spoke to me at his home in Calabria. Enzo needed protection for most of his life, and his family was subject to bomb threats. He said that Ndrangheta crime mafia in Australia and Italy fed each other as they became more and more powerful. I travelled to southern Italy as part of the research for this podcast. I was told that the spiritual home of the mafia was Plati, as we mentioned earlier, so I plugged that into the GPS and off I went. Travelling along the coast road, there were unusually big waves in the Mediterranean. But again, what struck me was how poor Calabria was. Given this rivers of cash flowing through the mafia's hands, why didn't they share it with the locals? And if they didn't, why did the locals put up with them? When I reached Plati, I looked around and noticed that heads were turning my way. My photographer started taking a few shots inside the car, quite discreetly, but within minutes, I noticed there was someone following us. I thought, no, that's not right, but I stopped again and and then I saw the car. That's when I decided to get out of there. They have so much money that they can pay anyone everywhere, so so they can buy whoever around the world. That was Enzo Macri again. He wrote the book about the mafia in Australia, and he was not surprised to hear that I was followed in Plati. It's absolutely normal that you were followed in Plati, because as soon as somebody new enters the town, straight away they ask you, what are you doing here? Can we help you? Enzo says that Andrangheta, which has now become the world's biggest mafia gang, was organised and disciplined. Wherever they go, they create the same organization that they had in the country of origin in Calabria. They recreate it in exactly the same way, the same hierarchy and rules. From the very beginning, the Australian police realized that they needed some help because the Indrangheta was becoming dangerous and they asked the Italians for help. Roman says during his police work in the Mafia, he found evidence of those strong links to the Italian organized crime structure. A traditional Italian organized crime uh, syndicates or family structures set up in Australia where um, there was crime that was engaged in by these families and it was predominantly, in in the drug realm at least, predominantly uh, centred around uh, marijuana cannabis production. Uh, but it wasn't only that, there was extortion in um, fruit and grocery industry, um, you know, there was some racketeering, gambling, um, etc. But it never, at that stage, had moved into different drugs, uh, you know, hard drugs, and narcotics, um, and, and stimulants. And as the group built strength in Australia, they kept those strong family ties. There were appointed heads of families uh, across the various states and territories, uh, predominantly in the, in the major metropolitan areas, but also in some of those regional areas that I mentioned, who were at the top of that hierarchy and would uh, call the shots, if you will, in terms of what kind of activity was engaged in, who was engaged in it, um, you know, where the profits were distributed, uh, you know, what violence to exact upon rivals uh, and or informants and all, all of that sort of thing. And that code was adhered to by and large, but human nature being what it is, there were always, always uh, exceptions to that rule and, you know, some young upstart in the family would want to 
take a tilt at the leadership and you know sometimes there'll be a splinter group or that person will be taken out but by and large it was a fairly rigid disciplined organization and the members of it both family and other crime members would adhere to that system so it was quite tightly controlled in a way it was tightly controlled and it, it very early on in like the, the first the first arrivals of uh um, Indrangheta or the, the Familia, the Honoured Society in Australia was around the 1920s and 30s uh, immigrants as you can uh, imagine and uh, they a, n- a number of those were members of the Calabrian uh, the original Calabrian Mafia uh, in Calabria um, but uh, that that honest system that they brought with them, that respect for uh, hierarchy and respect for uh, the appointed don or head of the family uh, was maintained over that tyranny of distance. So there wasn't a great deal of organised criminal activity engaged in Australia by those early uh, Calabrians that wasn't sanctioned or at least uh, wasn't uh, profit shared. Oh, really? So cash was going back uh, to Italy? Yeah, yeah. And that, that was part of the system. You know, the higher you're up, it's like any organised crime system, the higher you are at the top of the tree, uh, you know, the more cut you get of all the activity that happens at the bottom of the tree. And so, um, you know, approval would be sought for particular activities and, uh, you know, that approval was condition, uh, conditional upon money being sent back. And, of course, you know, there was all sorts of um, cheating and uh, rorting and you know, cr- crime going on that wasn't sanctioned because, you know, how do the Calabrian dons keep a track of something that's happening in Australia? You know, it was simply impossible. But there was that level of control that was extended out of the genesis of the Calabrian Mafia into Australia. And that discipline was tested. The murder of Donald McKay, an anti-drug campaigner in Griffith, New South Wales, rocked the Mafia. It drew national attention to the grass castles, the McMansions the Mafia had built in Griffith, and raised questions about how they were making their cash. Next time, we will reveal how hot-headed Mafia dons ordered a hit on McKay. And for the first time, we will reveal how there was one dissenting voice warning against the decision that changed the nature of the Australian Mafia forever. Uh, The Donald McKay murder is probably one of the most notorious murders we've had in Australia's history. And she was really um, very emotional when we chatted and she, all she wanted was an answer to the the death of her husband and I spoke with the family members as well and they were suffering. My read of their situation was that the murder of Donald McKay was driven by personal animosity not a business decision. But more on that in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. This podcast was hosted by me, Stephen Drill, and produced by Andrea Tees Evanson. Please follow and subscribe to this podcast on whatever app you are listening through. And leave a rating and review if you can to help spread the word.